So again, welcome to Magnets. Um, just to give you an idea of the format for today, we're going to have a 25 to 30 minute presentation. For the duration of that, please keep your microphones muted and turn off your video if you're struggling to watch, because that can use up your bandwidth. Um, after that, we're going to have 10 to 15 minutes of questions and discussion. You can either ask a question in the chat or just raise your hand, unmute your microphone, uh, and yeah, you can do it either way. I'll read out your questions if you put them in the chat. And then at the end, we'll turn off the recording and there'll be time for a brief catch up where people can chat off the recording uh, if you're interested. So today, uh, I'm pleased to have Nicole Clizzy here talking about uh, changes of zonal drift direction during the Le Champ excursion and the Matiyama Bruins reversal. Um, Nicole is currently a PhD student at Scripps at UCSD. Um, and we overlapped for a little bit at the end of my PhD there. So now I think I can hand over to Nicole and uh, yeah, she can give the talk. Um, hi, my name is uh, Nicole Clizzy, and uh, I'm a grad student working with Kathy Constable at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I'll be presenting changes uh, of zonal drift direction during the Lachamp geomagnetic excursion and the Matiama Bruins reversal. So here is uh, the Earth's surface and then the mantle, and plotted at the core mantle boundary is the radial magnetic field. Um, and blue. Uh, is negative and red is positive. And this would show the uh, magnetic flux concentrations in the equatorial region. And I wanna focus in on um, zonal drift, which is these uh, magnetic flux concentrations migrating in a eastward or westward direction. And particularly during um, two extreme secular variation events, the shop excursion and then um, the Matayama Bruins reversal. Um, <clears throat> these uh, bullet points are an overview um, of what I'll be going over. And I just want to point out um, the two highlights um, here, one and two, that I'd like you to take away from this talk. So I will be starting out with um, large scale coarse surface flow in the modern field. Uh, so I'll review. Um, the planetary gyre. And then a question that I have is, do these uh, features extend, or um, are these features in the paleomagnetic field? Is the planetary gyre a stable feature? And I will be using um, two time-bearing paleomagnetic field models, GGF 100K, which stands for the Global Geomagnetic Field Model for the past um, 100,000 years, and uh, GGFMB, which is um, the Global Geomagnetic Field Model for the Matiyama Bruins reversal. And then uh, I will use GAFAM, which is a um, historical geomagnetic field um, for the past 400 years, to demonstrate zonal motion using time longitude plots. And then I will show several time longitude plots um, to, to show zonal motion during Le Champ and the Matiama Bruins reversal. And that is where I'll um, hopefully convince you of the um, two highlights, a transition in drift direction around Le Champ excursion and the Matiama Bruins reversal. And both eastward and westward drift are reoccurring features for the past 100,000 years. And um, here this video uh, is the radiomagnetic field at the core mantle boundary. And you can see these um, changes in the magnetic flux concentrations. Um, and I want to go over, um, I do want to <clears throat> extend beyond zonal motion, but they also think, of, think about meridional motion, which is this like north-south um, direction and how that um, could possibly influence the um, dipole decay and recovery. 
So the large scale planetary gyre um, with satellite data, we get the best spatial and temporal resolution. And with that, um, the observation of this uh, um, eccentric gyre, um, this is a good diagram of the gyre. Um, and using um, the field model chaos seven, this is a snapshot for 2020. Um, we have the radiomagnetic field at the core mantle boundary. In the Northern hemisphere, it is dominantly um, negative, but there are regions um, you can see here and here that are positive. Uh, these regions are opposite of the expected dipolar field. Um, also in the Southern hemisphere, uh, most notably the South Atlantic anomaly um, is a reverse flux patch. There are also regions um, of strong normal field, and these are intense flux patches. See that here. Uh, the middle uh, panel, secular variation. You can see the high concentrations of secular variation in the equatorial region on the Atlantic side. And also um, in this region over Alaska and Siberia. And I'll uh, refer to that later. The bottom panel, um, this is a coarse surface flow inversion. And these are the streamlines. And you can see that this uh, planetary centric gyre is moving in an anticyclonic motion here. Um, so it moves toward the equator on the Atlantic side and then back toward the pole around the tangent cylinder. And then this high latitude uh, jet here, high latitude jet, um, and it's also seen with the high, uh, secular variation at this in this region. This high latitude jet um, accelerates around this tangent cylinder over Alaska and Siberia, and then it starts to slow back down. So the um, secular variation, um, there's two components to it. There's advection and magnetic diffusion. Magnetic diffusion is magnetic energy converted to heat. And then advection, um, so this fluid velocity and the magnetic field, this fluid uh, velocity, is this, this fluid motion is essentially transporting, shearing the magnetic flux. So if we refer back to this large scale planetary gyre, the, the gyre migrating or transporting these magnetic flux um, in the gyre-like form or gyre direction. So this is um, an observation in the modern field, but um, thinking about the paleomagnetic field, um, I used two uh, field models, GGF100K and GGFMB. Um, to construct these paleomagnetic field models, um, paleomagnetic sediment records and lava flows go into them, and then archaeomagnetic artifacts um, go into uh, GGF100K. Uh, GGF-100K does cover um, several excursions, and then uh, GGF-MB um, spans from 900 to 700,000 years ago, and it uh, covers the most recent uh, reversal. And you can see uh, that this is the um, data distribution. Um, there's better data coverage in the Northern Hemisphere compared to the Southern Hemisphere. And also um, there's a lack of coverage in the Pacific hemisphere compared to um, the Atlantic side. Um, that's also with uh, GGFMB, um, 38 sediment records, uh, the blue circles go into um, GGFMB. Both of these models are parameterized in space with spherical harmonics and in time with cubic B splines. We consider anything outside of the core to be a source-free region, and that allows us to downward continue to the core mantle boundary. So I do use Gotham, um, which is a field model um, constructed using uh, ship log data. Um, to I, I want to use Gotham to demonstrate this um, time longitude plot. It was first used 
um, and field models, but now it's very common in with numerical dynamo simulations. Um, so I have here plotted um, two snapshots from 1650 to 1850 of the residual field. Um, so they removed the time average of the axisymmetric field and they did a high pass filter. So this time longitude plot is at the equator. So it's a cross section um, at the equator. And if you can see uh, this positive flux here and for, at 1650, and then from 1650 to 1850, this, this flux migrates in this westward direction. And it's very nicely seen um, in this time longitude plot here. Um, so that's, I do want, I just want to, um, I, I did want to show the, these time longitude plots and um, kind of moving on to uh, the paleomagnetic field with GGF 100K and GGF MB. These time longitude plots are of the full radiomagnetic field at a high um, 55 degrees north um, latitude. So with GGF 100K, um, I had uh, these gray regions are the excursions here, and then these blue tick marks are paleomagnetic sediment records uh, within 20 degrees of 55 degrees north. You can see these reverse flux patches; they have a recurrence of about eight to twenty thousand years, and they're also um, intense flux patches. With uh, GGFMB, um, the reversal, um, the axial dipole um, component G G10 reversed about 780,000 years ago, and I've um, kind of marked that region. Um, so we were, so it was in a um, reverse polarity here, and so dominantly uh, positive in the northern hemisphere, and then after the reversal, dominantly negative. The reversal, um, so the dipole for the decay and recovery took about 29,000 years. Um, so that's about like the time um, the reversal took. And you can see at the start of the reversal, we have two intense or reverse flux patches, excuse me, two reverse flux patches here. And they develop and without, and you can see that there's this like westward, um, direction and then there's a transition to this eastward direction and then the uh, dipole flips and then it recovers. So you can see there's a change in drift direction preceding uh, the Matsuyama rooms reversal without any um, like filtering. This is of the full radio field. Uh, but with GGF 100K, I did have to do some um, processing with the, the for the time longitude plots. Um, it was very similar to what they did for Gotham. I removed the time average of the axisymmetric field and I did a high pass filter. So this uh, is an intense flux patch here and here. You can see that it is migrating eastward. And then the Champ uh, excursion about 41,000 years ago. And then there is a change in drift direction from eastward to westward. Um, so to quantify drift for the past 100,000 years, I used uh, the rate on drift determination. This is a diagram of um, the rate on transform um, using a time longitude plot. This projection angle um, can be directly um, directly converted to drift rate, which so this would be um, faster and this would be slower. I'm doing a sweep of these projection angles, I can do a sweep of um, drift rates. So if we have this uh, line S here, what it does, this rate on transform does, is it takes the integral across the time longitude plot of the magnetic flux. Um, and so that you can see this like zonal motion and how it could capture a strong magnetic, um, magnetic uh, zonal motion concentration um, signal. 
And I take this, square it, and then I sum it up, and that would give me the drift signal power. And I take a moving average of this process time longitude plot for the past 100,000 years, and I am able to see the changes in uh, zonal drift um, throughout time. So this is the moving average. Um, time is moving forward as we go up. Uh, and on this axis right here is um, drift. So positive is eastward and then neg negative is westward. I've also plotted the dipole tilt and that's black. And then also the axial dipole moment. This It's reversed and it's in red. Um, the color bar is the drift signal power. And then in the middle column, I've plotted the max drift signal power here. And you can see that these um, here, uh, these uh, strong drift signals are correlated with the reverse flux patches and generally occur during excursions, except for one region from nine, um, 90,000 years ago to 80,000 years ago. Um, that is not as, as associated with an excursion. There is um, high uh, variance in the dipole tilt, uh, dipole tilt. So <clears throat> there are reoccurring um, episodes of both uh, eastward and westward drift for the past 100,000 years. And the dominant drift rate is 0 0.08 degrees per year. So I do wanna kind of switch over. Um, I've So far I've only showed zonal drift, but I do wanna kind of um, transition from zonal drift to thinking about also meridional, so that north-south um, component. Um, and thinking about the gyre, there were two, uh, there were, you know, we do have uh, meridional um, legs of that gyre. <clears throat> um, and here you can see the development of a reverse you can see the development of a reverse flux patch. And there's some, there's some slight uh, westward migration, but you can see that it does migrate. It starts to migrate toward the pole. Yeah, and this is a reverse flux patch migrating toward the pole. And I wanted, um, I started to think about like, how does this reverse flux patch influence the axial dipole? Uh, moment. It is um, my, my grade toward the, okay. So this equation is uh, changes in the dipole moment um, and changes in the dipole moment as a, um, in terms of secular variation. And if we only consider the axial dipole moment with secular variation, we have uh, advection and um, diffusion. So U theta, is the meridional fluid velocity, and then these magnetic flux patches in terms of, uh, with BR. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me. So these, um, so I have here, uh, this is from uh, Chris Finley in 2016, um, and, we have the South Atlantic anomaly, which is a reverse flux patch. So we have the arrows are um, the gyre, and then the color is the radio uh, magnetic field. So this it's, it's not very distinct, but this is the South Atlantic anomaly, and then there's also a intense flux patch in the South at, um, Indian Ocean here. And considering how this, um, how the gyre could possibly be transporting these magnetic flux, uh, so for the South Atlantic anomaly, it's transporting it. It would transport it toward the um, pole, and then this uh, intense flux patch toward the um, uh, equatorial region, and that would be depict that is depicted here with the changes um, in the axial dipole moment. So the this reverse flux patch, the South Atlantic anomaly migrating toward the equator, which would have, um, it would decrease the axial dipole moment. 
So it's act against acting against the axial dipole. And then also this um, intense flux patch migrating toward the equator has that same um, effect. So considering these magnetic flux concentrations, the sign, whether it's a reverse flux patch or an intense flux patch, and also considering um, the meridional motion, if it's migrating toward the pole or toward the equator, influences the axial dipole moment. And um, kind of going back to um, the paleomagnetic field um, and trying to think about like, how would I see these, like the, these legs of the uh, gyre, this gyre. Instead of time longitude plots, I've uh, kind of switched over and this is time latitude plots. Uh, so this is at 90 degrees west and 60 degrees east. So about here and here. And to try to see if, like, am I seeing this, these possible legs in for the past, uh, this is 10,000 years with uh, CALS 10K.2 and PFM 9K. And uh, PFM 9K is the past 9,000 years, and CALS 10K.2 is the past uh, 10,000 years. Uh, right here, around 4,000 years ago, you can see the development of this uh, intense flux patch. And it does look like it's migrating toward the pole and then back toward the equator. And you can see the this influence of the intense flux patch with the axial dipole. Uh, it does um, increase, strengthens, but that's... Um, you know, that's the Northern Hemisphere. We also have to look at the Southern Hemisphere too. So we have these intense flux patches in the Southern Hemisphere. These intense flux patches in the Northern Hemisphere are not um, quite as seen with uh, PFM 9K.1A. Um, in the Southern Hemisphere, these uh, intense flux patches are seen. So that is for like the West side, but you know, if we go to 60 degrees East, um, can't, what what are we seeing? We do see um, an intense flux patch, but it's not a distinct signature in the axial dipole moment. Um, so kind of going beyond 10,000 years and looking um, at the past 100,000 years, um, I, I do use GGF 100K at similar, uh, in the same cross section of 90 degrees west here, and then also 60 degrees east here. <clears throat> um, so this right here is a reverse flux patch um, in the Northern hemisphere. And you can see that this reverse flux patch does migrate toward the equator, but there is not a distinct signal. It does, the axial dipole but, um, does increase, but it's not a distinct signal. Um, and then in, during the Le Champ, there's this reverse flux patch um, on the west side. And of course, um, the axial dipole moment does decrease. And then um, if we switch over to 60 degrees east, this reverse, there is another reverse flux patch. And I did show it in the, this, the video how this reverse flux patch um, does migrate toward the pole. And it also um, coincides with the decrease in the axial dipole moment. And before the Lachamp, from about 55 um, to 45,000 years ago, there's this, this uh, intense flux patch here and on the other side where there's a strengthening in the axial dipole moment. Okay. Um, and um, trying to track radional motion um, in the paleomagnetic field has been very complicated. Um, trying to capture the, like, to see if these legs, um, the meridional legs of the gyre uh, are in the paleomagnetic field. Um, and there are limitations with GGF 100K. GGF 100K is, um, is a lot, is uh, smoother than um, like GGF SS70 or LS mod.2, which are other two time varying field models that cover certain segments of the past 100,000 years. Um, but they have, they, um, the data that go into them are a lot more sparse than GGF 100K. Okay. And so GGF 100K might not 
it might be too smooth. And so what I've been trying to do is possibly go into the individual sediment records and trying to see how, uh, if the gyre does exist, how would it be seen in the um, in these paleomagnetic sediment records? Okay. Um, and that's kind of like where I'm at. Um, and then uh, I do want to end this uh, talk with uh, my two major takeaways. Um, a transition in drift direction occurs around the Lachamp. So from here, from eastward to westward, and also during the Matiyama Bruins from westward to eastward. Um, and eastward and westward drift are reoccurring features um, seen in this plot here for the past 100,000 years. Questions? Thanks, Nicole. That was a really, really great talk. Um, yeah, I think I have a couple of questions if uh, no one else does, but I will open the floor to questions to start off with. Um, so feel free to leave something in the chat or raise your hand. Um, but yeah, let's all give the whole virtual round of applause. Thank you. A bit of a for the questions to come in. Richard, uh, there's one. There's yeah, there's one from Richard. Are you trusting me to talk? Uh, yes. You yes, can... good. Yeah. Hi. Um, lovely talk. Nice work. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about the more detailed models, particularly that Monica has built up. Um, I mean, there's a bit more recent than the ones you talked about over Le Champ and the um, Prince Matsuyama reversal as well. Um, do you, if you, I mean, it seems like, you know, you're looking at some of these things, here's the 50 to 30,000 year period, which is more or less that model. Do you get the same kind of results if you use those more detailed models? Um, so I actually, the, I didn't put a link to the paper, but I do, um, I do that. I do use lsmod.2. Um, okay. Can you see this right here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, and this paper, and I, it, it just came out a couple months ago. I do evaluate both. Um, so I use lsmod.2 and, um, GGF SS70 and I do consider right. that and I do get very similar um like this the change but it's not as distinct um compared to GGF 100k so I do show that for um I do show that in these two models and so I get something that is similar um so but it's could, not as clear as um GGF so could that 100K. be that um the lower resolution model is basically filtering in out other stuff that might make a mess of things because kind of, so basically it's doing a good job as being a filter and yeah. it's better to use that model than the other models, but the more yeah. detailed models show similar kind of stuff, only they're more complicated. Yeah, and I also have the tick marks here um, yep. and you can, and you know, for at least GGF SS70, there's nothing, you know, from 90 plus, um, 90, degree, 90 degrees west. And mm -hmm. also for LS mod.2, it's just, you know, the, it just starts to wash out um, with GGF 100K, I still, um, you know, there's a decent amount of coverage at that high latitude. So that's something I, I did consider. Um, there is, you know, there are these, you can, it, it is there, but it's not as like um, obvious with GGF 100K. And so that like um, regularization, I think does help in terms of evaluating this. Um, and it, I think this is about 4,000 years in terms of like um, the, if you think about uh, the, peri yeah. the periodicity of this. Okay, so the more detailed models basically mm -hmm. give you a complete win, providing you phrase it correctly. So that sounds really good. Yeah. Cool. Okay, okay. can you see, um, the, you're not- you've, you, I'm, uh, I'm, you, you've done me, that's okay. Let other okay. people okay. ask more interesting okay. questions. Okay. Yes, any, any more questions, feel free to raise your hand. Don't yeah, there is. Hannah Rogers has a question in the chat that says, can you comment on the presence of eastward and westward drift happening at the same time in your plots? Um, yeah, let me go back to that. So, and uh, thanks. Uh, this, 
So the, in terms of like this, like signal from both, um, we get eastward and westward drift here. So you, this, like, for instance, um, this uh, intense flux patch just kind of like go, does go away a little bit and then it reappears. But um, in terms of both of these drift signals, it could be like this and a different um, reverse flux patch um, kind of migrating in also the opposite direction. And so it's a it's a combination of um, of these reverse flux patches also migrating. So since um, you know, if we think about the um, high latitude flux uh, patches, and you know, they're not like migrating in the same direction very nicely. Sometimes they do like shift backwards or shift toward each other and away from each other. Um, so that would be captured in these time longitude plots. It's very complicated, like <laughs> trying to evaluate uh, strictly like zonal motion and, and in terms of like, if it's not uniform, it doesn't come out quite as, not, quite as nice. But in general, you can see that like shifting over time. Does that answer your question, Hannah? All right, any further questions? I think we can take one or two more. Um, if not, uh, I think that I have one. Um, kind of as, as sort of a, a maybe a, a bigger sort of wider application overview of this, you talk a bit about the gyre, and then you talk about this kind of change in drift direction from eastward to westward. Is this indicative of some sort of process in the actual flow in the core that is changing and initiating these excursions and reversals? Um, or is it, it's kind of an effect that you see because of the excursion in a way? I guess maybe it's a bit of a chicken and egg question, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, going Kind of thinking about like this reverse flux patch, um, it does, I, I, you know, it does migrate toward the pole um, and it is during an excursion to think about like, oh, is this causing, is this, could this cause a reversal or, you know, is it a failed reversal um, or like the difference between, um, yeah, the, I, the difference between possibly like an excursion and a reversal. Does this cause the re a reversal or is this, from something else that's happening that is causing this. I, I'm not sure. I just know that like, this is how I'm, I think about it, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like, I guess maybe almost like a chicken and an egg situation yeah. going on. Yeah. Does that, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I guess... this is my, my viewpoint, you know, I'm sure other people have very strong views. Um, yeah. I, I guess, the, as well. you know, is, is this kind of a thing that's very typical of, uh, as you show here, it's it seems like it's only really happening at the excursion. So it's almost like this change is something that's kind of unique to excursions, which maybe that that could be something important for an actual process that generates these. I don't know. Um, yeah. I thought you had any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I do. <laughs> I do focus in on ex the excursion. I did concentrate on the excursion, but I'm also very interested in not just excursions, but like this time where it, it is, the, the field is a lot stronger and there is um, this, these uh, intense flux patches building, but I, I guess I'm not, I, I don't have strong opinions. I feel like I should be very open to like, you know, what are causing these? Um, Cause I think a lot of people have different views on that, um, you know, so. No, thanks, that's it's useful. I think it's, yeah, it's interesting to hear. Yeah, I, it's quite reasonable to sort of be hesitant to ascribe this to like some particular process, yeah. I guess. Um, we have another question in the chat that says, um, more sideways directions, eastward slash westward can be observed in the radon plots. Was it the one represented by the blue plus signal that you considered? If so, then why?
Um, so I think I understand the question. Um, actually, I, I, I don't, was the, rip. the, when you say blue, do you mean the magnetic flux or Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the, the blue signal. If you're referring to like possibly this, it's not just this um, intense flux patch, it's also um, this uh, th this reverse flux patch here. Um, so it's the combination of both of these when I use the radon transform. So if, if you look at this right here, it is taking, um, it would take the integral across this and so it would be positive, but then I would also get this like negative signal here, um, which would be negative. But but considering that I just square this, it doesn't matter if it's blue or positive, or if it yeah if it's um, positive or negative. Um, does that is that what you're asking? I think that might be what you're asking. Okay. Yeah. Um. Great. Uh, I think that's all I see for questions for now. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, our next speaker will be on the 2nd of October. Um, and so if you want to come along to that, feel free to. Um, if you are looking to speak or you know someone that's looking to speak, perhaps you have a PhD student, someone who wants to give a talk, um, we're filled up for the rest of the year, but we do have more slots next year. So if you know anyone who's keen to give a talk next year, um, feel free to send us a message. And also just to, to let you know that the YouTube is here and we have about uh, 120 presentations to view, but all of our presentations are uploaded there. Um, and with that, I think we should give Nicole another round of applause.